All right, so we are going to be recording. Um, welcome. Oh, that's cool. Cliff yeah, on. it is. My name is Vern Fish. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm, well, I'm currently the president of the Friends of Wabi, but I'm retired executive director of the Conservation Board here in Iowa, and I'm a paddler. And uh, one of my first trips in the Wabi Kimi region was in 2009. Uh, to, it came through Savant Lake, and that's how I look back then. The, the mustache is not as gray, so I have aged over the years. But I am a paddler, and so I'm looking forward to doing this. Uh, but I want to share a little poem with you, a few words of wisdom. Uh, there's a magic in the feel of a paddle and the movement of a canoe. Magic compounded by distance, adventure, solitude, and peace. And it's what drives me to paddle. And I think that's what's pushing Ray and, and Dan, who are sitting in that boat, to paddle the Green Mantle. And I think they found a little bit of that magic on our, on our trip in 2019 to the Green Mantle River. So we're going to share a little bit of the story, but I'm going to go back. Here. Most of you are very familiar with Wapakimi. Um, when it comes from a, a native language, it's, it's white, white water, or, or white as sheet. It's also the home to an endangered species, the woodland caribou. Uh, for those of you who haven't been there, this is Wabikimi, and I'll put it in perspective. If you're from the south border, there's the Boundary Waters, there's Quetico, there's woodland caribou, and there's Polar Bear Provincial Park, which is the largest provincial park in Ontario. Uh, Wabikimi is not the largest, but the second largest. May have, may have to do a mute there. And there's Thunder Bay, and there's Armstrong, the gateway. For me, coming from Iowa, I can get to Armstrong in 12 hours. For, for you folks in southern Ontario, I understand it's longer, up to 18 hours. So it's actually closer from the upper Midwest than it is in parts of Ontario. The park itself, it's the second largest park in Ontario. Uh, Can't hear you, Vern. Vern, please unmute yourself. Okay, there, now can you hear me? I'm not sure how that happened. Um, thank you, uh, again. We were, getting, we were getting enough feedback, Vern. I, I, I muted everybody, but oh, I need- It was Dave who muted me, all right. So, but, so if anybody needs to unmute yourself, you can, but, but I think it'll be cleaner this way. Okay, thank you. All right, so again, the park was created in 83, expanded in 97. Uh, it, it protects a lot of cultural and, uh, and natural resources. Uh, the thing I think is kind of amazing is it actually encompasses 10 lakes. Poor, poor Minnesota, it only has 10,000 lakes in the whole state. Wabakimi has that much in just the province, in the provincial park. It's a world-class canoeing uh, re recreational opportunity but yet there's less than 700 paddlers a year that went into it. And this year there were far less than 700 paddlers that went into the, uh, into the park. What is also special is it's surrounded by crown land, it, uh, include, which includes parts of five forest management un units. And that crown land provides access to six other provincial parks and three uh, conservation reserves. There, there's the list. And the thing that uh, I, when I did the math here, uh, when you add up all of the wilderness area, uh, including Wabakimi and the surrounding crown and surrounding provincial parks, it's over 10,000 square miles. Now, if you put that in, in, into a relative uh, thinking, uh, you would swallow the state of Vermont or the Prince Edward Island five times. Uh, that's a huge area. That's, that's as big as Vermont or Prince Edward Island five times over. It's a huge area. Um, the, uh, the areas I mentioned before, here's the Albany. Is Crown Land, Bright Sand is right there, uh, the Kopka, the uh, Otter Tooth. Uh, I, I throw in the Gull River, although technically we don't include that in the in the description, but I think it's part of the region. Uh, Ojet, and then the Atwood River. I mean, those are all some of the other units that are surrounding Wabakimi that give you that 10,000 square miles. Um, but back to our trip. We did this in 2019 before COVID. Nearest city was Armstrong. We actually put in on the Green Mantle Lake and we came out on the Albany River at the Minamiska Lake. Uh, water levels were normal. 
Uh, we had two Royal X boats, and you'll see why we had Royal X uh, when I show you the details of the trip. We actually flew into Green Mantle. Total distance was 75 miles, so this is a very doable trip. Uh, I rated it as intermediate uh, because it does offer some long twisting technical rapids. They're only C1 to C2, but there's just a ton. Uh, there's one of the rapids, but there's just a ton of uh, log jams along the way. Uh, did I mention log jams? So here's the crew. Um, there's Dan Otto. He's our, he was our resident Minnesotan. Uh, Ray, Ray is a, a botanist from the uh, University of Iowa in Iowa City. Hank is my longtime paddling buddy from Spencer, Iowa. And again, I'm Vern Fish. Our route, again, we started at Armstrong. Uh, we flew into Green Mantle Lake, which is up in the northwest corner. Uh, and then we paddled down the Green Mantle to the Shabasquaya. From, the, uh, from that point on, the, the river is known as the Shabasquaya, which I find ironic because the Green Mantle is actually a bigger river. But uh, we went down the Shabasquaya to the Albany, and we actually came out at the Chapel of St. Andrew on the Minamisca Lake. So that's where, where we ended up at, 75 miles altogether. Green Mantle is... It's a wild little river. It may lack girth and length, but it's long on adventure and isolation. It's hidden in the far northwest corner of Wabakimi. There's Green Mantle Lake, and the river provides access to a 50-mile swath of protected boreal forest. There's, there's no crown land on either side of this. It's a long ways away, so you just have a huge area of, of wilderness, a uh, very isolated region. Now, the other thing I'll point out, we did actually paddle up into Green Mantle Lake, almost to the headwaters. And so this is a trip that if you wanted to come up from the south, I think you could. We didn't look for that portage. And I would almost bet that you could come up from uh, further south in Wabkimi and find a, a crossover of the height of land and come in. Uh, but we actually started our trip on Green Mantle Lake. Uh, hang on here. Oh, 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 oh. That's not what I wanted. Hang on. There we go. Oh shoot. Did I, lo uh, did I lose you here? Hang on, hang on. My bad. Uh, what am I doing here? There we go. There we go, my, my bad. There we go. Uh, hopefully you're seeing the planning map in front of you. And I throw this up because one, the Friends of Wabakim sell it, but two, this is an important tool to uh, plan a trip because what a planning map does, it lets you know where the nearest city is, in this case, Armstrong. It gives you some idea where, uh, what the trip is gonna look like, in this case, the upper Northwest corner of the, of the park. Uh, and here's the other piece I think most people miss when they're looking planning map. Uh, that little corner, which you can't see very well for you, is right there. What that has is the actual Canadian maps that you need for that quadrant. In this case, it's 52 P6 and 52 P3, which is a real advantage. And then for my for this trip, we actually had to go to another quadrant. So there were, there were uh, four maps all together. And there they are. And But again, you can find that on the planning map, which I think is a heck of a, a, a good deal. Now, what I do is I go to a, a digital format. I can get yellow maps, uh, allows me to get uh, any map that I need in that map zone, which is 52, and all of these maps are 52 something. So that's where I went. And then I can digitally mit, uh, meld those together. And then I use the uh, Wabakini canoe maps that, that the Friends of Wabakini sell. Uh, and here are the, the uh, five volumes. And in this case, because the route was in that far Northwest corner, uh, volume two didn't help me very much, but volume four did help me. And, but it only covered the lower part of the trip. It covered, and I'll show you where the Mishnikau River Portage is down to the Albany River. So I did not have any details on the upper part, which is Green Mantle uh, Lake down to the Mishnikau. Uh, and then here's the thing that's really kind of disturbing. Uh, it was the only trip report I had was from a 
uh, uh, yeah, my, my Canadian uh, routes, uh, a little line of thought, and it was from a park superintendent that flew back in 2000. And he said all he could see was a, a giant wetland. It was just a big swamp out there. He could see no route between Green Meadow Lake and Susanna Lake. Well, that's a little disturbing. Uh, so that's what I had to start with. So plan planning challenges, there were no trip reports for the uh, upper half from Green Meadow down. The park superintendent said that in, in 2000, it was just a big wetland. Uh, volume four only provide information on the lower river. So there we got, you can see some of those little maps on this map right here. I didn't have a whole lot of information on the upper part. What I was able to do was go on Google and all the red that's on there or what I could see on Google uh, was as far as rapids, and I put them on the topo map. But that doesn't mean they're accurate. Uh, for example, uh, the on the Google map, stream coming out of the green mantle, which I'll pull up here. Oh no, hang on, hang on, that's that's a problem. Doot, 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 doot. Here we go. Technology is a wonderful thing. There, cool. All right, so what you're seeing here is the uh, actual map together for the trip. And right there on the Google map, that looked like a canyon. It looked like a giant whitewater cascade. But when we physically got there, it was just a log choke shallow stream with three little separate portages. Uh, so you can't always count on Google to give you information you want to know. And then the other thing that when we got there, we found out real quick, this was not going to be a first descent because one of the first things we found was a portage blaze. So somebody had been there at some point in time. Now the trail hadn't been cleared or used in a long time, but there were portage blazes. And the irony of that, that particular blaze right there, when I put my hand on it, it fell over. So it's no longer there. But uh, somebody's been down this river before. We were not the first people to go down it. So you guys have all done this. You pack the food. Uh, we had to drive up to North Branch and met Dan up there. And when you repack, drive to Armstrong, spend the night at these, load the otter, which I'm always amazed how much stuff you can get in the back of an otter, and then fly into Green Mantle Lake. And then, of course, Hank has to give everybody a hug before we go. I don't know if he's sick or what, but he always has to give everybody a hug. And then what's the first thing we find when we get there? There's a dock. So obviously, we're not the first people there. And then the thing that's kind of discouraging is there was actually a hunting camp, a fishing camp, but nobody's been there in a long time. Uh, looks like a bear got into that cabin. Um, they have a lot of modern conveniences. And you find this, which I'm sure all of you have found this on trips. And what this led to afterwards was I had a, a several conversations with the park superintendent and we've all found debris out there in the, in, the, in the park. And one of the things that came out of our discussion is, is there anything we can do to help clean this up? And I'll talk about that at the end of this presentation, but yes, there is, and you can help us do it. So we'll talk about that a little later. But obviously this was a, a camp that hasn't been used in a long time and the bears have been in, on the, in all the structures. So that's where the, uh, the, the camp was. That's where we landed. That's where the dock is right there in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, as we went down the lake, we found a total of three more campsites or what could have been campsites or what were campsites. There were actually a couple of cash boats on some of those. And then we stayed right here at Camp One. Um, and um, that's what the first campsite looked like. Green Mantle is a pretty good sized lake and it's a beautiful, beautiful little lake. Um, there, were, there wasn't anybody else out there. The portage out. Well, okay, this is what it looked. You see the look on Hank's face. He's a little, little worried here. Uh, we did find that uh, that uh, portage blaze, so we know somebody's been here before. And we sort of kind of did a combination of things. We cleared a little bit of portage. Uh, I think Dan and Ray did, they did all the portaging. Hank and I decided to try and jam the boat down the middle, and that's what that looks like. And then with the, the, uh, adding insult to injury, at the end there was a beaver dam, the last thing. Uh, let's see what Hank thinks about this. Hank, where are we, where are we at, Hank? Well, let's see. Starting our first portage, where there is no portage. We're at the uh, east end of Green Mantle Lake. Day two. Day two of a 10-day trip into the unknown. And, and this, this is what we're seeing. 
little bit of running water, but not enough to paddle. Vern identified this huge old cedar. Yeah, she's big. And this is what our trail looks like. And we're not here to clear portage. We're just going to get enough of an opening that we can get through it. But uh, are you ready for this, Hank? Another excellent adventure, Vern. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, from Green Mantle down was a big mystery. No details whatsoever. Uh, kind of a nice flowing meandering stream. Had a few uh, uh, ester uh, banks that were pretty cool. Didn't climb up and look at them. But I'm guessing that'd probably be a good place to camp on one of those banks. Uh, and did I mention the log jams? Um, were there logs? Yes. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of logs. <laughs> I'm easily entertained. All right, so just a little ways downstream from uh, from Green Mantle Lake, we ran into what I called a topographic change. Uh, the river abruptly changes from a small meandering stream to a narrow ribbon of water. You can see it on the map there. It's actually that little blue circle. It, at first, I thought it was just a, a mistake on the to topo map, but you can actually see a difference in the on the topo map. It shows a wide stream and a narrow stream, and uh, you can actually see it on the map. I assumed it was an error, and but the river actually becomes noticeably narrower, and this is what happens. <laughs> Wildlife, yeah, we saw a lot of wildlife. Uh, probably saw a dozen moose along the route, lots of swans and lots of other things, but the highlight of the trip. Hey, Dan, where are we at and what just happened? We had a quick encounter with a good-sized bear right How after the uh, oxbow that you had on the map. How big was the bear, Dan? It looked really big. How close was the bear, Dan? It was too close. <laughs> <laughs> but it really didn't care touch. for us either. <laughs> it ran, eh? To reach out and touch? No, but I'd say 15 feet. 15 is close enough? All right. Somewhere in there. A close encounter of the uh, cuddly kind on the Green Mantle River. All right. Not every day you have a bear get in the boat with you. Um, got to uh, Suzanne Lake and... Uh, Again, that Google search showed that there was a big opening uh, at the end of the lake. And yep, when we got there, uh, obviously this is somebody's fishing hunting camp and it looks like a bear got into it. It really made a mess out of it. But for us, it really provided kind of a nice place to spend. We, we, we uh, overlaid here, spent two days. Uh, and so that was a nice place to actually have a picnic table in the back country. That's always a blessing. Uh, and when we sent our, our satellite note to uh, Don, uh, Don Elliott, uh, this is the message we got back. You're the first that I know that have paddled that section of the Green Mantle. Congratulations. You now have completed the most difficult portion of your trip. I would argue this was not necessarily the most difficult, but it was kind of reassuring to know that not too many people have done this trip. Uh, I also post my trip reports on canoeing.com, who's one of our corporate, one of the friends of Wabakini corporate uh, partners. Uh, and one of the things I got back was uh, I got an email from a gentleman. Uh, he says I've been fishing and hunting for 25 years. Our gear's never been messed around with except when a bear got into it. It looks like a bear had done it again. He's used Don to fly in and out. Um, and he's, fish he's fished and hunted all over North America, but nothing matches the fun of fishing and hunting in Green Mantle Lake. Must be something in the water. Regards, uh, Rod. So if Rod's on the call tonight, uh, thank you for sending an email back to me. And one of the things that we found pretty special about that lake was the brook trout. 
Uh, I, I, I'm from Iowa where brook trout are about six inches long and I've never seen a brook trout the same size in my paddle before. So I, uh, that was a cool thing for me to get to catch a brook trout and particularly a brook trout of that size. Uh, this is the second portage of the trip. Uh, this is coming out of Suzanne Lake, and it was not not a tough deal at all. Um, we might have been able to line or run down this rapids, but it's always nice to have a, a portage to go down. So there, you know, that's a well-traveled portage. There have been people on that in the past. The rest of the, the going on down from there, pretty scenic. Uh, we did a lot of this uh, lining because it just sometimes it wasn't real conducive to try and run it. So we, we got our feet wet along the way. The, one of the highlights of the trip for Hank and I was the uh, portage that supposedly goes into the Mishnikau River. Um, Hank and I had gone down the Mishnikau in 2016. We had found the access to the portage from the Mishnikau, and we had actually uh, gone all the way to the lake in the middle, which is right there, but we couldn't find a trail, and so we didn't actually make the jump across. So on this trip, we're looking, we're really wondering, is there actually a portage on the other side, on the green mantle side, and leave it up to Dan. He found it right off the bat, and it's well marked. There's no secret; uh, it's a well marked portage. You could actually see where there probably were campsites. I think historically this was a, a, a well used uh, a route to connect the two river systems. It just hasn't been used in a long time. So it was kind of neat to be on both sides of it and to be able to see that this this is uh, actually a route. And, and at some point in time, it was a heavily used route. The the next step down was the confluence of the Shabasquaya and the Green Mount. Um, again, Hank and I in 2016 had, had lined and paddled up the Shabasquaya to this point. We had portaged across that 519 meter, and then we had walked down to the confluence where we found a campsite. So we knew there was a campsite there, uh, and yep, it's still there, plenty of room. Uh, there were chunks of metal scattered around. So there, there's somebody had a cabin or something there at some point in time. But for me, having been there in 2016, it was kind of neat to come back and actually be able to stand there and, and look up the green mantle and now say that I've been down the green mantle. Because in 2016, I kind of took a look at that and go, I want to go paddle that river. So I finally got to come back. Pretty cool to be back at that point after all those years. Ray, you look awful comfortable. What have you been doing all day? Paddling. Where have you been paddling? Uh, we came down the rest of the Green Mantle to the confluence with Shabusquia River. What do you think of the Green Mantle? Love it. What's, what do you like about it? It's a fairly, it doesn't have a lot of volume, so the rapids are interesting, but not super pushy. What don't you like about it? It's not the like. Okay, there you are. Thank you. All right, so from the up to the confluence, it was log jams, and now it turns into white water. From the confluence on down, you can see all those red lines, and that's my abbreviation to shoot line or wade. I could see them on Google, but I really didn't know what, what the level of them was, and we found out pretty fast. Uh, this was pretty good. This was fun paddling. And uh, Ray and, um, and Dan drew the short straw on the first morning after uh, uh, to, to leave the campsite at the confluence. So this is what it looks like right after we pulled out of the, uh, the campsite on the conf, at the conf, oh, hang on here. What did I do wrong? Right again. Now we'll try it. Real hard to scout these. You, you, you almost got to run them blind. This is a pretty impressive run by Ray and Dan.
And just like that, they disappear around the corner, our turn. Well, after running about another dozen of those, we actually come out on Patty Lake. There's a little campsite there, uh, had lunch. And then we stopped at the upper falls on the mighty Albany. Uh, the next day we went down to the lower falls. Uh, we went around the Snake Falls. Uh, I, had, I had been fortunate enough to run the Albany in 2010 and, and actually ran this, but Hank and I took a hard look at it and we decided it was better just to portage around it. Beautiful little campsite right there on our way to our takeout point. The uh, Albany is a classic Little North River. It's a, a it's a beautiful river. If you've not been up on the Albany, you really need to see it. It's hard to describe it, uh, but it's a, it's a big, beautiful river. Here's a little piece of it. And of course, we had a botanist on the trip with us. And who would, who knew it? There are elm trees on the Albany River. And Ray, who is a botanist at the University of Iowa, had a conversation with the park naturalist and the biologist. And as far as we know, these, this is the farthest point north in Wabakimi where you find elms. So he noticed it. I didn't. And finally, the chapel. This is the takeout point. Now, I was able to uh, visit this. Uh, on the Albany trip uh, back, whatever it was, 2010, and pretty cool little building. Uh, it's the St. Andrew. Uh, it actually was established in August of 1984. Uh, it hadn't changed, been there a long time. Uh, it's still an active church. There's still money in the uh, donation plate. So it's kind of kind of cool to use that as our as our uh, takeout point of where we finish the trip. And. If you've, if you've ever been in the North Country, you know that this is the only way to do it, is to fly in. That's a sound that you all should appreciate. Well, I gotta give everybody on the trip credit because I've used everybody's photos. I've used everybody's videos. Uh, again, used Don Elliott to get us in and out. Uh, Guardian Angel was Dennis Mullen. He's the guy that's on the other end of the satellite phone. If we get in trouble, he's the one that's gonna help uh, get us out and, and tell all the folks back home what happened to us. And again, we've got trip reports on our corporate partner, which is canoeing.com and, and on wabakimi.com. We got it in both places. So, I want to talk a little bit about the Friends of Wabakimi. As you know, uh, Phil Cotton created the Wabakimi Project. It morphed into the Friends of Wabakimi. Um, part of what I wanted to demonstrate today was uh, how to plan your trip. And using our, our canoe route, we have five volume of maps. The planning map is critical. And coming out in the spring of 2021, uh, Lawrence Mills is putting together a Wabakimi canoe route guidebook. And this will actually have routes not just isolated portages and, uh, and uh, campsites. This will actually have routes and have all the details that go with it. And so we're looking at putting that together and publishing it and having it ready by March of 2021. And again, all this information is on our website at wabakimi.org. Again, you can go there, you can pull down the five, you can buy the maps there and the big planning map, which is what the Friends is all about, providing canoe trip information, maintaining these routes, and protecting and conserving our habitat. And if you remember the garbage scene I showed you earlier, uh, well, that's our next initiative, uh, planes, paddles, and portages. Uh, if that bothers you, um, and it bothers me, uh, this is actually a photo that came from the park superintendent. When we had that discussion, we finally kind of went around and around. We thought, how can we help you with this? And he said, well, we don't have budget to fly garbage out. We've got, we got portage crews that can go in and out. They can get the stuff ready, but we don't have budget to fly it out. Can you help us raise the money? And the board of directors has signed on to this. And so we are going to be working with the Wabakimi Park staff to actually remove some of this legacy debris. And again, legacy in the sense that some of this was on the landscape long before the, the land became a park. And so there's just been no way to get it out. Well, we're gonna help them get it out. 
And what we're going to do is the park staff is going to do, they're going to cut this stuff up, in this case a boat, jam it into an otter, fly it back to Armstrong, and let me get that out of the way. And working with Ontario Parks, we're going to get that out of the backcountry. Now, what we need uh, is to raise the money to do it. And what we're going to do is go to these lakes in the north. It will be Grayson and Burnstock, Burnt Rock, I'm sorry. And there they are. And then in the south, it'll be uh, Surprise and Cash. And you, that's uh, just north of the railroad down there. And our goal is to return this to a, a natural setting. And there's probably on those four lakes, there's a, a, maybe a dozen or more sites that need to be cleaned up. Altogether, the park staff have identified 144 sites that need to be cleaned up. So this is just a first good step. But our goal is to raise uh, seven, over 7,000 Canadian, over 5,000 US. Um, come on, there we go. All right, so you can go to our website and use a credit card. Or you can send it to Debbie in, uh, uh, in Thunder Bay. That's our corporate address. Or if you want, Canadians want the tax benefit, you can contribute directly to Ontario Parks. Or you can call a number and, uh, and this will allow you to use your, this will allow Canadians to use their credit card and uh, we, we get credit for it. So we need your help on that. Coming up in the near future, uh, we're, we're gonna be working with the park superintendent. He is on, on, on the first phase of the park management plan and he's gonna hopefully share it with us. And we're trying to get that scheduled for December. Uh, Mary Blaisdale has, has volunteered to do a trip planning uh, webinar. Uh, Ray and I are probably gonna do something on the Armstrong Forest Management Plan. This is the crown land that's just straight north of Armstrong. And again, sometime in March, Lawrence Mills is gonna do a interview to talk about the guide he's been working on. And we've got some other topics that are in the works. We just aren't prepared to announce them at this, at this point. But with that said, I'm gonna take us to questions. And uh, if you'll unmute people, um, Dave, or however you wanna do this, if we've got oh, questions. People can, uh, people can unmute themselves. Okay, very good. And then I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you. I might be able to find you a little faster. So raise your hand. Um, comments, questions? What were the bugs like? Uh, they were not too bad, although you, I think you saw our bug tent. Uh, that's a uh, cooked custom sewing tundra tarp, and that's really handy. So there are a few days where they they weren't bad. They're not as bad as, as way north. They're not as bad as getting up in the tundra, but it was good having that tarp there because you can get inside it and give you a little respite for a few hours. Got pretty heavy in uh, on the Albany around the falls. We were into black fly and so. stuff. Yeah, that's that's one of the paddlers there. There's Dan. Yep, that bug tent, Dan spent a few days in that bug tent. That's a good thing to have. Uh, it just makes life simpler. What were the dates of your, of your trip? Uh, I was in June of 2019. I, I'd have to go back and look. Like June 19th is a date that sticks in my mind. Somewhere, uh, I think we were out there eight, nine, 10 days. Such a quiet. I got all. Did, did, did you? Did you? Hi, this is Mike. Um, I'm up in Duluth, uh, or I guess for you up. But um, did you fly out of Armstrong then up to your starting point in the Green Mantle Lake? Yep. Yeah, we flew in and flew out. We flew okay. in. We flew in the Green Mantle, and then we uh, had a plane come pick us up off the Albany. Okay. How, how much was the flight? Uh that's about about five hundred dollars. Oh God, what was it? Ah. Uh, I, I think it cost everybody about five hundred dollars a pop. Okay. I'd have to go back and look. I can look. If you go to my trip report, I'm pretty sure I summarize that the the cost stuff. Um, so if, if you need more details, you can either go to the Friends of Wabakimi website or canoeing.com. I believe the trip reports are posted on both of them. So Vern or Dave, is this being recorded so it can be on our website and we can have people play it back? Yes, yep, yep. And uh, uh, if Dave will get it posted on the website as quick as he has time, probably probably tonight by midnight, right, Dave? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to say uh, there's some folks uh, on this, uh, uh, this uh, Zoom meeting that we don't have in our 
Waba, friends of Wabakimi system. I mean, we don't have your email address. So if you could share that with us, we sure appreciate it. So you could, we could send you our emails and maybe a few requests to join. <laughs> Will do. Um, what's the latest in the year, latest in the season you'd go? Well, I, I've had, I've been snowed on, on in September 15th in the boundary waters. Uh, somebody help me here. I never did a project uh, Wabakimi trip. I, 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 Phil didn't go into September, did he, Dave? Did you, did you yes. Did he? <laughs> First okay. week. Up, he? up to about September 15th, I think. Okay, well, I, I would think that's about as late as you'd want to go. And, and got snowed on, yes. <laughs> well, there you go. Some of the okay. things you got to you got to watch in is uh, a lot of times the planes and stuff they shut them down and that kind of determines when you can go too. Okay, so we're looking at it, thinking about a trip next fall, or you know, late summer, early fall. Well, if, if you don't fly, if you just rode in, then you don't have that. That and there are there are a few places where you can park a car, not very many, uh, but there are some trips. And actually, we would encourage, if you get offline, we have conversations about that, where we'd like to see people go. We're doing a lot of, of work in the Armstrong Forest, which is the uh, uh, forest unit just straight east of, of the park. And we'd love to see some people get in there and paddle because we're telling the Ministry of Natural Resources that it, there are paddling routes there. And so we'd love to have trip reports from those areas. Yeah, for people who uh, have been on trips before, and I recognize a few names, that's in the Big River, um, Moonshine Lake, uh, Dalton Lake area, and all the way up to Cliff Lake. I uh, question, I noticed uh, your canoes had spray skirts on them. Are spray skirts available for rental up there from the outfitters? That I'm aware of. I, I'll, uh, I think Dan, uh, Dan, and I think Dan's on the call. He, he answered the question himself. Uh, I, I had mine done locally, and Dan, I believe you sent yours up to uh, Cook Custom Sewing in the Twin Cities. Is that correct, Dan? Yes. Yep. But uh, I'm not aware that you can rent them anywhere. And and on this particular river, because we ran into a, a fair amount of white water in the last the lower half of it. I think there's some advantage to having that. I, that little clip I showed you, you can see some of that water flying around. It, it's always good to have a spray skirt to keep it out of your boat. Okay, thank you. We wanted ideas for primarily uh, flat water routes to so go to the wabakimi.org site for trip suggestions. Dave, I'll let you handle that. <laughs> well, I, I I have a fondness for the Vail Creek route that I that I did last uh, in 2019 with my daughter, and uh, uh, there's a trip report and uh, my route guide for the Vail Creek route uh, on the Friends of Wabakimi website in our trip report form. Um, uh, there's a lot of people that worked on the Vail Creek route in uh, 20. 17, 16, 16 17. Um, and it's a very pretty route. It takes you through from Tunnel Lake, Rocky Island Lake, Tunnel Lake, down through Mountain Lake and down the Mountain Portage to Vail Creek on the way down to Mountain Lake. It's a beautiful lake and with uh, good fishing for lake trout and uh, pike and walleye if you get down to the Meban Lake. And I've been, I've been uh, on the, I think, 14 years worth of trips. And uh, what we're trying to do is put together a group that, of people who are experts in different areas. I know like Bill Pyle's been on a, a lot of different trips and his trips are different from mine and mine are different from Doug Blount's and his are different from John Sinclair's. And everybody's an expert on certain places, but mm -hmm. you might have to talk to two or three people to cover a whole route if you're going in a long distance, let's say 60 kilometers or 60 miles or so. And that's what we're here to do. If you, if you send us an email, we'll do the best we can to get you to the people who either have done the route or know something about the route. And, and hopefully when our guidebook comes out next spring, we'll be able to answer that question with a piece of paper and a book rather than trying to find the person who's actually been on the route. That's one of our challenges. Unless you could come up with like paddle.com does sometimes where they'll, somebody asks a question, anybody been in 
such and such an area uh, on your website, um, you know, maybe something like that too. And, and if it gets out there, yeah, I traveled that and this is what I seen or whatever. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, probably a lot of things you can do with that. Dave, would, Dave, you want to talk about our two corporate partners? Um, maybe that kind of... Yeah, well, um, well, Vern mentioned uh, canoeing.com, uh, Tim Eaton's uh, website, um, and we actually have our maps up for sale on canoeing.com, and they reach a lot of people, um, and we have a relationship that we're working on with... Um, Paddle planner. I know some of you who have paddled Quetico and Boundary Waters might have used the paddle planner website for some trip planning purposes. They're going to have a Wabatini section uh, by early next year, uh, so they're they've partnered with us um, to to indicate routes and portages, and that's another tool that people use for 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 planning. So those are the those are the two two outreach things we've got going right now. We have some others in the in the pipeline that we're going to work on as well. And we also this is Ray. We also keep an eye on bwca.com and my CCR and try to help people out on those locations also. Hey uh, Vern, uh, Dave, quick question on your Green Mantle trip. Little question here: What? How many tents were you guys able to? How many tents did the sites uh, uh, accommodate? Generally speaking, we, we all there. All of us had solo tents, so we had the four individual tents plus the uh, you know, the tundra tarp, the yellow tent you may have seen in some of the images. So we yeah. were able to find room for five five tents. One of them is pretty good size, uh, but with said. Two of the sites were well-established, you know, sites. We also had two sites that were basically, we, it's getting dark, we got to find a place to pitch. So, and I'm not an advocate of doing that because I don't like going in and, and creating a site, but we ran into that on two evenings. But because this is, it, it's, it's old forest, there's, there's space underneath. We, we didn't have any trouble finding space for all of those tents. Now, again, we had to look a little bit, but we were able to get all five of them up on every night that we set up. Well, thanks a lot. This was uh, very informative. And yeah. um, I was, uh, my, I think he's on too, um, a friend of mine and I have uh, been starting to do more trips uh, on these rivers. Uh, we've done the blood vein, Gammon blood vein and Manigatagan. And we were hoping to do the Kopka uh, this past year, but of course we couldn't, we couldn't uh, get across the border. So we're hoping to get back up into this area again. And I've wanted to do the Albany now and you've only, uh, increase that and then as i said before we even got on this tonight i go you realize we're just going to have another another trip on our, our backlog list to, to do now so uh this looks fascinating looks like a fun trip well the whole the whole wabakimi again it's it's so huge uh, you'll, you'll spend the rest of your life and not see it all but but i have to admit the upper albany from highway 599 on the yep. west google that that, that, that the table lamp at 30 percent that is a that there's a lot of white water spectacular uh but but do your, do your homework before you do it because there's just a lot of places where you can get in trouble there's a you, there's a lot of white water on that stretch okay and it, since i since i have a, a an audience here um uh my friend and i were wondering is there if if we took the um on this cop if we went in at wigson and went down the, the river to rush bay and go up to collins is there a portage from collins into Schwabenablis, <laughs> or I'm probably butchering that name, but there he is. Hi, Bob. Hey, Schwabenablis. <laughs> yes. Is there is there a is there a portage that that you can get from Collins to that? Anybody? I I was there actually this summer, and I have to go back and look at my map. But I believe there is. I think that's exactly what we did. We okay. went we went up to Collins River and then portage. And then Dan went to Kopka. Excellent. Thank Thanks. Let me find out for sure. I'll, I'll go back to the maps. Thanks. Well, and, and people are going to start bailing out here, which is good. But uh, I do want to emphasize we're trying to help the park clean up some of those four lakes I identified. We really, this is our first fundraiser. And uh, this is a good partnership with the park. And we want to make sure we come through. So, 
Dave and I are pushing this real hard. Uh, we're, we're both going to make contributions. We encourage you to go to the website, take a look at that. Uh, and what we'll, we'll hopefully do is give you an update on how that works, lots of photographs. But if you've ever pulled into a lake and found that what we found on some of those sites, you know the need for this. So help us raise that money. Go to the website, look into it. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Dave will say thank you a thousand times. Is the one on uh, Burnt Rock, is that there because there is garbage there or what? what's Burnt Rock for a pickup site for? I, they, they, the park staff have identified, again, this legacy debris. Sometimes it's cash boats, sometimes it's fire damage, it's debris. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but there's between those four sites, there's more, those four lakes, there's more than a dozen sites. Uh, so they're, they're, they pick those sites because there's more than one spot that needs to be cleaned up. And so I can't, okay. the history personally, I haven't seen it, but they identified that as a priority and that's what they want to fly out first. So, okay, that sounds good because I, if the border opens, that's where I was supposed to go this year, but uh, <laughs> it was burnt rock. So uh, that could be a possibility on my end too. Well, help us clean that site up then. Yep. Yeah, I was wondering uh, with uh, border closed this year and maybe for a while next year, I just wondering how like Don Elliott and the other outfitter up there, I mean, um, Oh, How hard did that hit them? You know, I talked what? to uh, I talked to Don Elliott uh, a couple times this summer, and he does. He says he he'll be fine because he's been in business for thirty five years. But uh, he says some of those smaller ones, they're just they're not going to make it. Yeah, and that's always been one thing about that park is uh, it's not easy to access by yourself. You almost need an outfitter to get you in to the places you want to get at. I'm hoping that's something you guys are planning on changing a little bit um, to make it more accessible. Well, ho hopefully it's like Don said, we need more people coming in and out of that park. Uh, we need to spread the word. But the, again, the challenge is, as I kind of identified the planning issues I ran into, it, it we need to provide the information so that a first time tripper can get there. And that's hopefully what the guidebook is going to do. Uh, but then the other thing that we're trying to do is using these online venues as a way to communicate and get that information out. Uh, you know, we're not going to be able to do any of the paddling shows, uh, Canoe Copia. Well, I'm going to, hopefully I'm going to do a presentation at Canoe Copia, but it'd be virtual. Uh, right. So until all this passes, but we just need to help communicate that because it's a little done uh, for the, a first time paddler to go in there for the reasons you just identified. There aren't that very, very many outfitters. There aren't that many places where you can park. There are some. Uh, so you need that information to plan a trip and you need people to ask questions. About too. And so hopefully we're going to try and fill that void and get more people out into this beautiful area to help protect it and enjoy it. One, one of the other problems with, um, with Wabakimi is that there's five river systems there and they all flow west to east. And if you access one, and you jump into another, you might not be able to get back to where you want to get to. And so uh, if you start in the west, in the crown land, and you head towards the Albany, or you head south towards Burnt Rock, or you head even further south and try to get into, um, like, uh, uh, what do you, that river? Uh, Allen the Water. Flint, the Flint and the Allen Water. Then you're heading east, but your car and everything else are where you started is way out in the west. So, and the same with starting from the south, you know, you're still heading north and east all the time. So, access is, is very difficult. It's not like you can go in and do a loop trip because you're halfway out. You're starting to head back upstream if you want to get back to where you started. Yeah, and if it were pool and drop, pool and drop, it wouldn't be that big an issue, but it's not necessarily that. Well, it's a lot of pool and drop, but... Uh, once you head over uh, one little, um, uh, what do you call a height of land, and you're into another rhythm, river system, good luck getting back. You know, you get 15 kilometers downstream, you're not even close to the, the river system you want to get back to. Right. Um, and that's another difficulty in, in creating a trip, because we never crossed from river system to river system in the, in the 15 years that I've been doing it. Uh, except on rare occasions, like when we went from the Savant and then headed back into uh, the, um, what's that one called? The uh, the one that goes through Burnt Rock and all that, um, Palisade. 
you might skip over a height of land, but like I said, suddenly you're 20 miles away and no way to get back unless you backtrack. So that's one of the difficulties of coming up with loop trips in that area. Well, and, that, and that's where the railroad can play a role in that too, though, because you can start in Armstrong, go west, and then paddle back east, or start in Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And one of the other things about that is that that's why we, we created five map books, because those map books deal with different river systems, whether it's, you know, the, uh, the Savant River going up towards the Albany, or the, the tributaries coming into the Agoki from the north, or the tributaries from the south, or all the, the rivers that come from the south and go north, and then the rivers that go into Lake Nipigon. Um, a lot of those things are totally different areas. And... You know, if you want to create a three-week trip and do the whole park, it's, it's pretty tough because you're in different river systems. Yeah, I don't know about a three-week trip, but in the east part of the park, there are road-to-road -road loops available. Um, you still want to use an outfitter to park your car. The, it does not have the parking lots that you would find, say, in the BWCA. Um, but there are road-to-road -road loops available in the east. Yeah, and, you know, there are in, in the west, if you stay in, like, if you started out on the highway that goes up to, um, what's that called, uh, where the mine is? Um, Pickle Lake. Pickle Lake. You start on that highway, you can go in Savant Lake, head up the Savant River, head over McRae Creek and down to Pashkakagan and all the way back to your car in about two weeks. But you got to stay within that system. You can't cross over into another one. And you can you can paddle forever in that area as, as uh, Vern would know, but you, you have to stay in that area. So many options, but it is, as the Ken is pointing out, it's more difficult than the boundary waters because of the, the flowage. You're in the, you're either the Arctic uh, drainage, or you're in Lake Superior drainage. I mean, those are pretty major, major divides. So, but uh, and that's why, hopefully, as as an organization, we can help provide that information. Because I, I still remember spending the little bit of time I spent with Phil. We talked about the the beauty of the Boundary Waters. It's a great place for uh, entry level to paddle. But if if you want to go to another level of difficulty and you don't want to fly into Great Slave Lake, what's that next level of dip difficulty? Well, it's it's Wabakimi. It's a, it's it's more difficult in the Boundary Waters. But it's not as difficult as going up into the into the tundra. You can drive to it. I always remember Phil saying that. You can drive to it. Yeah, it's a little harder to drive to Great Slave, although you can. But it, it's that intermediate. But it's but that because it is just a little bit harder than the boundary waters. It scares people off. But it's such a great experience. Uh, you can literally disappear, as Phil would say. You can spend all summer out there and not meet somebody else in a canoe. Um, that's not going to happen in Quetico or the boundary waters. So. Our, our job is to help give people the skills uh, and the maps and the information they need to go experience a huge roadless area that has some pretty special opportunities. So we hope, we hope that you help support us uh, and uh, join, the, join the organization. I, I'm, I'm getting a sense here that, you know, that people are saying that this is good. This has been valuable. Uh, this webinar was, was a good idea. Am I getting a you – know, give me, give me oh, a high. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you. Well, and, I, and I also want to say th th those uh, books that are right behind you, um, you know, that's I've been using that to help with the our Kafka planning. Yeah, those those are great. And I know Barry that Simon that worked on a lot of those. Um, I did a trip with him in the Arctic. And um, uh, so I appreciate those those resources as well. And we now sell the planning map in a lighter. Uh, Dave can get the, the weights here, but in a, a lighter. Oh, yeah. 24 pound folded planning map. Say it again, Dave. 24 pound folded planning map. And right now we have a special deal on our website, a holiday gift package. The Jerry Vandiver CD that includes the song Wabakimi along with the folded planning map for a, for a great price. So buy now. Order, <laughs> order now while supplies last. Right. Literally, we, only, we have a limited number. Debbie's got 15 of them coming to her, and Bill's got 15 uh, here on the on the on the U.S. side. So once we get past 30, we got to start. Over. Yeah. So jump on it, folks. Great. I can't. I can't have.
So now those those planning maps that what information do they have on them? Because well, it's I, I've been on the websites. I want one of those, um, but I need to know that it's got something I can actually start marking a route well, and then researching afterwards. As I pointed out in my in my PowerPoint, it, one of the things it provides you is where the actual uh, Canadian topo maps are. We, you know that that little corner it, it'll tell you which topo map you need for the area that you're looking at. That's valuable right there. Uh, I got to be honest, the one thing that this does not have that the park map has is the cabin, the outpost cabins. Our, our, the, our planning map does not show the outpost cabins. The park map does show uh, those, map, uh, those cabins. So sometimes it's good to have both of them together. But really what this is, it starts to give you an idea. If you've got, if you've got the, one, our, our, our volumes, then you got the details. But then this will help you start to figure out a route choice. And again, hopefully next spring, when we get the, uh, the guidebook put together, you'll actually have a route laid out with all the information you need, which will make it a whole lot simpler. You won't have to go through that, that kind of little guessing game I went through to plan the green mantle because I, you know, there were no trip reports. Our maps didn't cover it. The park map doesn't cover it. And so you know, I had to go find the maps and do, do the uh, Google search and all that stuff. Hopefully the guidebook will take some of that guessing out of the out of it, makes uh, make these routes a little easier to find and follow. And thanks for doing that. I think that's a, that'll be super helpful. Well, yeah. hopefully in March we'll have it ready, and we'll have a webinar on it. So come back in March when we do the the when Lawrence uh, uh, the editor uh, uh, does a question and answering session with it. So it'll be our first chance to really get into it. Yep, I know I noted that. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a date yet, but sometime in March. Planning map is not meant to be navigational. Right? No, no, it's too big to deal with. Yeah. But, so you, you use that to plan out the big route and then you go to the topos and the and the guidebook maps. Okay, but does it have portages marked at all? Well, it has the routes mapped. It has the routes okay. and the portages. Yeah. That, that's where you need to have this. The books. That will have the, that'll have that kind of detail in it. Okay. Yeah. Now, it doesn't, doesn't it have little red lines where the portages are, but, and it might even have distances, but it doesn't tell you whether it's uh, river right, river left. Um, no, that's our, what, our map doesn't do that, although the park, that? the park map does show portages. Well, that's kind of silly. They don't tell you whether it's river right or river left. Bad map. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the adventure. That's right. Um, a lot of people ask uh, whether we have um, GPS coordinates for a lot of these campsites and, and portages and things, and we don't. And Phil was adamant about it because he said a lot of times when we're up there and it's a cloudy day and we're taking readings, you might get five meters accuracy. Now, when you're up there on a cloudy day and you, we've got five meters accuracy going in and you've got five meters accuracy on the water, you might be 10 meters out. And when you're going over the Savant River Falls, 10 meters can make a real difference, especially if you're looking for the portage. So we didn't want to put those, those GPS coordinates on anything because it would just confuse you. Uh, if you need a GPS to get through this place safely, then maybe you shouldn't be there. You should be relying on maps and because uh, we don't want anyone to go over to Savant River Falls or, or things like that. <laughs> Thank you. And that's still part of the adventure is finding them too. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And if you got our maps, you have a good idea where they are. Yeah. We found very few errors. Everybody's having so, so much fun, they don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm heading out. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, take a look at the website. Check out the uh, our, uh, our our fundraiser. So we're trying to do that clean. You know, I hope we can get join if you're not a member. Uh, and we're going to do this again. So we'll stay in touch so we can get the uh, dates to you and the times. Dave, thank you for promoting this. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. doing it. Yeah, thank thank you, everybody. Very useful. Yeah. I just, thank you. Know, you. Um, I I run the Facebook page and and I see a lot of names here and a lot of faces from the Facebook page and thanks for coming out to the Facebook page. We try to keep it updated and, and give you up to date information and stuff. And uh, I appreciate that a lot of you have showed up at this. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you.